Hi, I'm Matt Payne, and welcome to 20th Century Revolutions, episode 1.2, The Serbian Revolution. Last time, we left off at the height of Ottoman influence and power during the reign of Suleiman the Magnificent. Suleiman's reign had lasted nearly 46 years, but towards the end of his reign, and then especially upon his death in 1566, the Ottoman Empire began to shift from being an expansionist military power on the rise to being a highly bureaucratized Islamist state ruling over a vast multi-ethnic empire within an ever-changing early modern world. The 150-year period after the death of Suleiman was defined by a few different transformations. First, we have an at times revolving door of sultans, there being no less than 13 different rulers within this time period. And second, we have increasing economic pressures like rising inflation and a ballooning imperial budget. And then third, we see a rise in unrest and outright rebellion in the provinces. All of these pressures would lead to a shift in the balance of power within the imperial structure as the sultan lost much of his direct personal authority over the empire with other figures gaining power at the sultan's expense, such as the grand vizier, essentially the prime minister, and then the women of the harem, specifically the sultan's consort and the sultan's mother. Possibly the most influential of these women who ruled during this era known as the Sultanate of Women, was Qasim Sultan, who would play a major role in shifting the way in which imperial succession operated in the Ottoman Empire. Qasim Sultan, who, like many of the Sultan's consorts, was of Greek origin and had been enslaved as a young girl, seems to have been very influential in convincing Sultan Ahmed I, for whom she was a favored consort, to spare his brother Mustafa from being killed when Ahmed became sultan. This was a major break from previous practice, as, like we saw last time, sultans would historically put all of their half-brothers to death when they took the throne. Qasim's desire to keep the sultan's brother alive likely came from an ulterior motive, as she hoped to save her own sons from being killed in the future upon Ahmed's death. After being spared execution, Ahmed's brother Mustafa was thereafter forced into isolation within a section of the imperial palace that came to literally be dubbed the Cage, as it gradually became policy to isolate the sons of the sultan in order to avoid the civil unrest and fratricidal war that would so often accompany the death of a sultan during the expansionist stage of the empire. The soon-to-be sultans were hidden away during their youth in this imperial cage in order to prevent them from forging early alliances. And while this policy of keeping potential successors in forced isolation did solve the problem of bloody succession, This, like, weird, luxurious house arrest that sultans would grow up under led the leaders of the Ottoman Empire to have, like, uh, no practical skills whatsoever as a ruler by the time they ascended to the throne. Some of these imperial captives, Mustafa being the first, even developed mental disorders due to their strange predicament. In practice, what this meant was that the sultans were more often than not led by figures behind the scenes who held the real authority within the empire. Figures like Qasim Sultan, who would come in and out of power during her nearly 50-year tenure as consort, mother, and then grandmother of the sultan, and she ruled as the de facto head of the government for much of this time as queen regent. In addition to these changes in the structure of imperial rule, the nature of the Ottoman Empire as an expansionist state also transformed during this time, so that between roughly 1566 and 1700, the territory of the Ottoman Empire remained relatively stable, neither expanding nor contracting. And this settling down in terms of territorial expansion 
changed the nature of the Ottoman Empire pretty dramatically. Now, even though the empire was not actively expanding, the Ottomans were often still at war, really kind of always at war, with their imperial rivals in Europe against the Habsburgs and Russians, and in Asia against the Persian Safavids. For a long time, these wars led to just very minor territorial exchanges here and there, until the late 1600s, when things began to take a bit of a turn for the worse, when the Ottomans faced a devastating defeat at the hands of the Europeans in the Wars of the Holy League, known in Europe as the Great Turkish War. This war, which began in 1683, would last until the end of the 17th century and was fought between the Ottomans and then an alliance of European Christian empires led by the Habsburgs and the Russians. The Wars of the Holy League represented a humongous conflict that was essentially waged by the Christian powers in an effort to prevent further Ottoman expansion into Europe. After being emboldened by a victory over the Poles, Sultan Mehmed IV, the grandson of the now long-deceased matriarch Qasim Sultan, attacked the Habsburgs, and the Ottomans then nearly took Vienna in 1683. But at the last minute, the Polish king John Sobieski came to the city's rescue and repelled the Ottomans, doing his best Gandalf routine, you know, emerging over the hill as the sun rose behind him with the riders of Rohan at his back. The Polish king was thereafter named by the Pope the Savior of Western Christendom. And though the Pope was being a bit melodramatic here, for Western Europeans, the Battle of Vienna was often seen as the moment in which the encroaching Ottomans were miraculously pushed back. This narrative of Christian civilization facing off against Islam to the east would remain important within the imagination of Europeans all the way up until the Ottoman Empire fell, and really you could argue all the way up to the present day. For the Ottomans, the Battle of Vienna was somewhat of a catastrophe. Christian Europe had aligned against them and would eventually snatch away a good portion of their European territory. Because after the Battle of Vienna, the Pope was freaked out that the Ottomans had once again made it that far west, and he initiated the forming of a Holy League headed by the Habsburgs. The Russians, whose empire was at this point now right up against the Ottomans, also joined the League in 1686, which was a very significant development for future events, as this was the moment when the notorious rivalry between the Russians and the Ottomans was really solidified, a rivalry that would continue all the way up until World War I. From this point on, the sultans and the czars will literally fight a war like every 20 years. So get ready. This war ended with the Treaty of Karlowitz, in which the Ottomans, kind of for the first time, gave up massive amounts of territory in Europe. With the treaty, the Habsburgs and the Russians would become the dominant powers in Central Europe as the Austrians pried away from the Ottomans much of Hungary, Croatia, Slavonia, and they made Transylvania a client state. The Ottomans were then forced to give up the region around the Sea of Azov to the Russians. The Wars of the Holy League would lead the Balkans to emerge as a hotly contested area, and it would become a battleground of sorts for wars between the Ottomans, Russians, and Austrians that would continue well into the 1700s and beyond. Now, just so we're all on the same page here, the Balkans is a modern descriptor, and no one at this time would ever describe themselves as being from the Balkans or like being a Balkan. In the broadest sense, the term just describes what we could understand as like Turkey in Europe or the Ottoman provinces within Europe. The term Balkan was actually coined by some random German dude who incorrectly thought that the Balkan mountain range was much bigger and more significant than it actually is. Even though he was wrong in this assumption, sometimes these things just stick, and so it was for the term Balkans. And since it's what most people are familiar with, we are just going to roll with it. 
And if you want to visualize the Balkans, there are some helpful maps at 20thCenturyRevolutions.com. So, in the Balkans, again, just European Turkey, the Ottomans still held large amounts of territory even after these wars with the Russians and the Austrians. This included at least nominal control over the all-important Danubian principalities, what is today modern Romania and the old stomping ground of our dear friend Vlad the Impaler. Though, this area would be occupied by Austrian or Russian forces from time to time during the course of the countless on-again, off-again wars. Along with the Danubian principalities, the Ottomans, after a few additional wars, were able to kind of pry back control over the southern Balkans in what is today modern Greece, Bulgaria, Albania, and Serbia. All of these areas of the Balkans would thereafter become hotspots for revolutionary activity over the next several hundred years, and these rebellions will begin to take on an ever more nationalistic character. This growing resistance against the reassertion of Ottoman rule was perhaps most prominent early on in Serbia, because Serbia had actually been declared an independent kingdom for about 20 years. This kingdom of Serbia emerged after the Habsburgs had conquered it, or liberated it, depending on who you ask, and the Austrians accomplished this conquest largely by employing the help of many local Serbs unhappy with the Ottomans. And though the Habsburgs would appoint governors to rule this new kingdom of Serbia, the Serbs would get a taste of self-rule, and the time spent under Austrian hegemony was fairly prosperous. And so, after the Ottomans reconquered Serbia in 1739, the Serbs would never again be quite as obedient as they once had been, and they constantly chafed under their returning Ottoman rulers. In an effort to get these newly emboldened Serbs back in line, the Sultan enacted a series of pretty draconian punishments against them. You know, forced labor, crazy high taxes, public executions, enslavement. And all this led to a mass migration of kind of biblical proportions of Serbs out of Ottoman Serbia as they fled to nearby territories controlled by the Habsburgs. And then, when the Habsburgs and the Ottomans were back at war in 1787, a number of these Serbian refugees would go on to form the so-called Serbian Free Corps, which was a Habsburg-led militia of Serbian soldiers who had been given weapons to help fight the Ottomans. Newly armed, the Serbian Free Corps sparked a revolt in Ottoman Serbia, and with the help of the Austrians, they actually had success in driving the Ottomans out of the Belgrade province, which would once again fall under Habsburg hegemony, though this time around it would only last for a short three years. Because the Ottomans would reconquer Serbia in 1791. But they decided to take a pretty different approach this time around in reasserting their rule. Instead of implementing draconian punishments, which had largely backfired during the earlier reconquest, the Ottomans actually granted the Serbs new rights and privileges and appointed a friendly Ottoman governor, Haji Mustafa Pasha, who would earn the moniker, the mother of the Serbs, due to the positive reforms he helped to bring about. Now, this brief period of peace within Serbia under Haji Mustafa would very quickly become threatened by the rise of a rebellious governor in a nearby province within modern-day Bulgaria. So that's right, boys and girls, it is time to talk about our very first rebellious pasha. As we will see, many different pashas, which in this context just describes like regional Ottoman governors, will become increasingly rebellious as they sought to gain more and more autonomy at the expense of the central Ottoman authority in Constantinople. These rebellious pashas will come to include some pretty legendary figures like Ali Pasha of Yanina in western Greece and Muhammad Ali Pasha in Egypt. These pashas would eventually consolidate what essentially became proto-modern states, and their rule acted as a transition of sorts from Ottoman imperial rule 
to the nation states that would emerge in the Balkans and in North Africa. Ali Pasha and Muhammad Ali Pasha will be very important for later events in Greece and Egypt. However, the man who will serve as the first rebellious pasha to garner our attention is Pashavanaglu Osman, who will grow his power base in modern-day Bulgaria. Early in his life, Pashavanaglu Osman had seen his father, a once powerful leader amongst the Janissaries, be turned on by the Ottoman authorities as they tried to curb the power of influential regional leaders. As part of this effort, Osman's father was executed and his estates on the Danube River were seized. Pashvanaglu was able to escape this crackdown on his family, and he would go on to serve in the Austro-Turkish War of 1788, the same war our friends in the Serbian Free Corps had joined in on, except Pashvanaglu actually fought for the Sultan, seemingly proving his loyalty to the Ottomans. However, after being demobilized at the end of the war, Pashvanaglu went on to gather a personal army of disaffected imperial officers and troops, including rebellious janissaries, who, like his father, had seen the sultan turn against them and were resisting. When Pashvanaglu's army successfully held off the forces sent in to suppress them, the victory unexpectedly galvanized the surrounding population with other mercenaries, former imperial troops, janissaries, and then a bunch of just like brigands and bandits and highwaymen coming from all over the Balkans to join Pashvanaglu's army. By the mid-1790s, Pashvanaglu had firmly established a power base centered in the city of Vidin in northwestern Bulgaria. Unfortunately for the Sultan, Selim III, this revolt directly coincided with Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798, and so the Ottoman military obviously had, like, bigger fish to fry. Napoleon and his wily foreign minister, Talleyrand, even at one point approached Pashvanaglu with the hopes of making him Sultan under French protection. Though these plans never came to fruition, they speak to the extent at which Pashvanaglu was just acting on his own and completely snubbing the sultan's authority. From his stronghold in Vidin, Pashvanaglu would launch raiding parties and other small invasions into neighboring provinces, including Serbia and the Danubian principalities. This created a rivalry between Pashvanaglu and Haji Mustafa, who, as the Serbian mother, fought to defend his population against what had essentially become an uncontrolled pillaging band of robbers. Being largely unable to stop Pashvanaglu with his own Ottoman imperial forces, Haji Mustafa followed the lead of the Austrians and decided to form a Serbian militia to help him fight off Pashvanaglu's army. This strategy largely worked, and the Serbs helped push Pashvanaglu back into northwestern Bulgaria, and Haji Mustafa rewarded the Serbs for their service by giving them further rights and privileges, including the right to bear arms and to form military units, rights typically denied Ottoman Christian populations. Amongst these Serbian irregulars helping to fight off Pashvanaglu was a hot-tempered Serbian who had been dubbed by the Ottomans as Kara George, or Black George, a name that arose as much from his reputation as a fierce and uncompromising fighter as it did from his dark hair. Early on, Kara George had gained experience fighting in the Habsburg Serbian Free Corps, and when the Ottomans initially reconquered Serbia, Kara George became a kind of Robin Hood-esque bandit as he continued to resist Ottoman rule. Along with many other Serbs of this time, Kara George was eventually forced to flee into Austrian territory. However, when Haji Mustafa was facing potential defeat at the hands of Pashvanaglu, he decided to declare an amnesty for former Serbian rebels, which allowed Kara George to return home, and he then joined one of Haji Mustafa's militias and helped push Pashvanaglu back into northwestern Bulgaria. 
Even though Pashvanaglu had kind of been put back into a box, he still had a powerful army, which meant he was eventually able to strike a deal with the Sultan in 1799, in which he was officially made a Pasha. Now, this sort of thing was actually pretty typical of the late Ottoman Empire, as regional warlords would become so powerful that the Ottoman imperial government would see it as like their best option to simply bring these powerful leaders over to their side and to try to fold them into the imperial structure. And of course, this also just reveals how little control the Sultan now had over many of his territories. The presence of Pashvanaglu in a neighboring territory would, however, continue to be a headache for Haji Mustafa, because simultaneous with these events, Mustafa had also sought to expel unpopular Janissaries from his territory who were essentially terrorizing and overtaxing the local Serbian peasantry. Now, these are the sort of things that earned Mustafa the name Mother of the Serbs. And actually, Mustafa's expulsion of the Janissaries had been approved by the Sultan. However, due to the Sultan's preoccupation with the invading French, the expulsion order was not able to be fully implemented, and many of these Janissaries found refuge with the rebellious king of the bandits, Pashvanaglu. This all led to further skirmishing between the two Pashas, Mustafa defending the Serbs and Pashvanaglu leading a group of rebellious and tyrannous Janissaries. Because the Sultan was distracted with lots of other things, you know, Napoleon, many of the despotic Janissaries were able to slither on back into Serbia, and then there was this like brief period when it looked like the Janissaries had changed their ways, and maybe everyone was gonna just get along. But yeah, that was never going to happen, and the Janissaries proceeded to assassinate Haji Mustafa in 1801. And then, after fighting amongst themselves for a while, they gained control of the province. Now in control of Serbia, these Janissaries went back to doing what they had always done. And over the next few years, they continued to terrorize the local Serbs, you know, forced labor, crazy taxes, public executions, enslavement, and a handful of Serbian leaders who had grown pretty tired of all of this decided to reach out to the Sultan for help. The Sultan was supposed to be their protector as Christian minorities within the Ottoman Empire paid their taxes supposedly in exchange for being able to peacefully practice their own religion. When the Janissaries caught word of this plea for help, they feared that the Sultan would once again use the Serbs to try to oust them from power. So, in an attempt to head off such an action, the Janissaries organized the assassination of around a hundred Serbian leaders in what became known as the Slaughter of the Knezes. After massacring these well-respected Serbians, their heads were paraded around in order to inspire fear in the local population in hopes of preemptively squashing any future rebellions. This effort completely backfired as the public murders directly led to the first Serbian uprising of 1804. In response to the slaughter of the Knezes, Surviving Serbian leaders held a secret meeting during which they made a plan for a general uprising against the Janissaries. Due to his renown as a relentless and experienced fighter, Karadjorje was the undisputed leader at this meeting. At first, Karadjorje proved himself to be a pretty self-aware guy, and he argued that his temper was simply too volatile, and that a more, you know, even-keeled leader should be chosen. The rest of the Serbian chieftains persisted, however, and the wildly popular Karadjorje was selected to lead the rebellion by a simple show of hands. Karadjorje had a lot of success in gaining followers early on, as the Janissaries had created massive resistance amongst the Serbian peasantry, who had briefly enjoyed a relatively stable and undisturbed life under their leader Mustafa Pasha. 
And then, you know, the Janissaries had assassinated this beloved Pasha and then massacred hundreds of their local Serbian leaders. Because of this misrule by the Janissaries, the Serbians quickly had an army of over 20,000 troops, many of whom were drawn from these unhappy Serbian peasants. This army then combined with an army sent by the Sultan to help destroy the rebellious Janissaries. And so the Janissaries had brought down upon themselves the one thing they had been most eager to avoid— a huge Serbian army being led against them by the Sultan. And in this way, the Serbian revolution actually began as an effort to expel the Janissaries and to restore Sultanic rule. One interesting development during this period of fighting was that many local Muslims fought alongside Christian Serbs as they all wished to drive out the despotic Janissaries. These Muslims, known to the Serbs as, quote, good Turks, were both part of the imperial army sent by the Sultan, as well as just local Muslim peasants. These combined forces successfully drove out the Janissaries so that by August of 1804, the Serbs had captured and executed the leaders of the Janissary forces and began consolidating their territorial gains. By this time, however, the Sultan was becoming increasingly worried about the revolutionary Serbs, who were clearly growing ever more emboldened. And indeed, Karadjorje, now riding high on his recent military victories, was demanding near-complete autonomy for the Serbs. And the Sultan saw all of this as just one step too far, and sensed that the real goal here was independence. And so he declared war on the rebel Serbs. This break with the Sultan charged the conflict with an ethno-religious character that was somewhat new and that Karadjorje encouraged as he appealed to medieval Christian mythology in order to recruit Serbian peasants, calling upon ancient memories of things like the martyrs of the Battle of Kosovo, who had resisted the initial Ottoman conquest in our last episode. The religiously and ethnically charged warfare that ensued proved to be pretty brutal on the civilian population, with burning and looting of Muslim Turkish property and then reprisals taken against Serbs in response. This all led to a refugee crisis with Islamic Turks moving into fortified cities and many Serbian refugees escaping into the wilderness to form irregular guerrilla units or following their predecessors and fleeing to Habsburg territories. Against all the odds, the Serbians were able to take the great capital of Belgrade in late 1806. And due to Serbian military success, the Sultan was nearly about to give way to all of these demands when larger forces outside of the Balkans took hold of events. As mentioned earlier, the Ottomans had had to drop everything and fight off General Napoleon Bonaparte when he launched his campaigns into Ottoman Egypt and Syria. Now, I know we've been bumping against Napoleon a lot, and don't worry, we will eventually cover the complicated legacy of the French-Egyptian expedition later on. But for our current purposes, we just need to know that this campaign ultimately ended in defeat for Napoleon, and by 1801, the Ottomans had, with a little bit of help from the British, successfully held off the French. Just a few years later, though, Napoleon was stomping all over the Russians and the Austrians at the Battle of Austerlitz, ending the War of the Third Coalition with yet another French victory. With a little bit of French encouragement, the Ottomans smelled Russian weakness after this defeat at the hands of Napoleon and decided to press the advantage. So, the Sultan took the opportunity to depose two regional leaders who, even though they ruled Ottoman territory in the all-important Danubian principalities, they still had pro-Russian leanings. Simultaneously, the expansionist French had begun to encroach into the Balkans, eyeing Russian territory in Central Europe. In response to this French encroachment, 
and to the removal of the Russian preferred Ottoman rulers, the Russians sent a 40,000 troop contingent into these Ottoman vassal states. All of this led the Sultan to declare war on the Russians, beginning the Russo-Turkish War of 1806 to 1812. As Napoleon, the Russians, and the Ottomans began to look each other down in the Balkans, Belgrade became ever more important on a grand strategic level. Now embroiled in the Napoleonic Wars, Karadjorje and the Serbs forged an alliance with the Russians against the Sultan, which was certainly helpful in the short term, but which also made it so that the Serbian cause was now dependent upon Russian aid and troops. Fast forward to the summer of 1812, and Napoleon was beginning his invasion of Russia, which meant the Tsar's troops had to be pulled out of the Balkans. This led to the eventual collapse of the Serbians, and the Ottomans would converge on the territory in the autumn of 1813, defeating the Serbs and re-establishing control of the area after a nearly 10-year period of what was essentially self-rule by the Serbs. The return of Ottoman control in Serbia was harsh, with, yep, you guessed it, forced labor, crazy taxes, public executions, and enslavement taken against the armed and civilian populations. During the reconquest, the Ottomans famously built Skull Tower, which was a grisly construction some 15 feet high, built from the heads of nearly 1,000 Serbian rebels. The Ottomans had clearly not learned anything, though, as the return to draconian Ottoman policies led to a fierce backlash, so that within just a couple of years, the Serbs were back up in arms, beginning the Second Serbian Uprising of 1815. This second uprising was led by Miloš Obrinović. Obrinović was a pig farmer who had fought in the first Serbian uprising, and he was one of the few rebel leaders who managed to stay behind in Serbia after the Ottoman reconquest. The second Serbian uprising saw early success as Obrinović and his revolutionary army were able to pretty quickly drive off the Turks. The exhausted Ottomans, probably seeing all of this as just not really worth the effort at this point, finally capitulated to the Serb demands for self-rule when an Ottoman official made an unwritten agreement with Obrinović allowing him to rule the province. This led to the de facto creation of the Principality of Serbia, a now autonomous state whose only tie to the Ottomans was basically just a yearly tribute to the Sultan and the light presence of the Turkish army in Serbia. These achievements by Obrinović brought into reality the goals Kara Georgie had held during the first Serbian uprising, namely establishing independent control of the Belgrade province. However, after attaining this unwritten permission to rule, Obrinović approached the goal of independence very differently, proving himself to be a much more subtle and crafty man than his predecessor. So, being the smart dude that he was, Obrinović immediately reached out to the Sublime Port in order to strike a mutually beneficial settlement. In this way, Obrinović assured that he was the Sultan's preferred Serbian leader, a fact that explains why, when Kara Georgie re-entered Serbia, Obrinović would actually execute the fellow rebel leader and then literally package up Kara Georgie's head and send it to the Sultan. Now, Obrinović did this because Kara Georgie had actually been sent as an agent of the newly formed secret Greek revolutionary society, the Feliki et Tyria a group that, don't you worry, we will learn all about next episode. After the first uprising was defeated, Kara Georgie had escaped to Russia and then joined this secret Greek revolutionary society as it had some pan-Balkan aspirations and the society hoped to make use of Kara Georgie's military experience. Because Kara Georgie had been sent by the Felikia Tyria, a blatantly anti-imperial revolutionary society, 
Obrinovich felt that he had to deal with him swiftly and summarily because he was playing the long game with the Ottomans and currently trying to win the favor of the Sultan. This assassination would have lasting consequences, as in later years, a fierce rivalry would emerge between the Karadjorje clan and the Obrinovich clan, and control of Serbia would trade back and forth between these rival groups for many generations to come. Having done away with his revolutionary rival, Obrinovich then put his focus on building the wealth of both the Serbian economy and his own livestock business. Over the following decades, as the Sublime Port was endlessly fighting wars they could not afford to fight, against the now rebellious Greeks, and then once again against the Russians, always against the Russians, the Serbian leader cleverly made the Sultan more and more dependent upon him and the Serbian economy for financial help. In the period between 1815 and 1830, Obrinovich had basically made himself one of the richest men in Europe, and in the process, he also gained written recognition of Serbian autonomy by 1830, making it an official Ottoman suzerainty. The limitations on enacting foreign policy under a suzerainty, however, did not stop the ever-shifty Obrinovich from playing both sides in the Russo-Turkish War of 1828 to 1829, when he shipped grain to the Ottomans, to whom he was officially aligned, even though this grain was coming from behind Russian lines, an area Obrinovich was able to access because of his friendly relations with the Russians as fellow Orthodox Christians. Through clever diplomatic and economic schemes such as these, Obrinovich and his Principality of Serbia had become a virtually independent state. This was not all sunshine and daisies, though, as the Machiavellian tactics of Obrinovich came at the cost of a heavily exploited Serbian peasantry. Obrinovich would himself face increasing resistance from both rival chieftains as well as from disgruntled peasants throughout his rule. Nevertheless, Serbia had achieved lasting autonomy and would never again simply be an Ottoman province. And then, by 1878, Serbia would receive formal international recognition as an independent state with the Treaty of Berlin, an incredibly consequential treaty which came about as a result of the so-called Great Eastern Crisis, and which we will be returning to later on. This treaty formally recognized the now independent Kingdom of Serbia, and just over 35 years later, it would be within the ranks of the army of this new kingdom of Serbia that the revolutionary terrorist society, the Black Hand, would be formed. The Black Hand had as its central goal the liberation and unification of the Serbs and their South Slavic neighbors, many of whom chafed under Austrian domination. And so it would be that in 1914, the Black Hand would take a most consequential step when they assassinated the heir to the Austrian throne, Archduke Franz Ferdinand. This event, which had grown directly out of Serbian revolutionary nationalism, would go on to be the catalyst for the beginning of World War I. But more on that later. Next episode, we will turn to another group with revolutionary dreams in the Balkans, the Greeks, who, like the Serbs, would take up arms against their Ottoman overlords. In so doing, the Greeks would launch a conflict that would inspire nationalistic sentiment across Europe as volunteers began to flock to their aid. In this way, the Greek War for Independence would act as a precursor to later international struggles, such as the Spanish Civil War and World War II. With this help from international volunteers, and eventually with the help of the great powers, the Greeks would lead one of the very first successful revolutions to establish a modern nation-state. ¶¶ 